Hello, Somerville. Kat Powers from the Somerville Media Center, virtually here with Council President Matt McLaughlin. How are you doing today? Doing all right, Kat. How are you doing? Fantastic. Fantastic. Happy to be here with you to talk about tomorrow's council meeting. Um, to start, I want to congratulate you for your win for the residents along the I-93 corridor. Uh, this is, um, we've all read Representative Connolly's amendment to fund a design study for sound walls along I-93 in East Somerville, and it was adopted by the House of Representatives. What does this mean for us right here in the city? Well, I think it's a positive step forward, but uh, sometimes I can be a glass half empty type of person or a realistic person. Uh, and I thank Mike Connolly for uh, bringing this up and continuing to fight for sound barriers along on 93. But we've been down this road before, uh, pun intended here, is uh, we've been promised sound barriers where we have uh, allocated funds. Uh, both Mike Connolly and Senator Pat Jalen have allocated funds in the annual state budget for sound barriers several times at this point. Uh, and the governor and Massio T have not respected that funding request, even though the money was allocated for it. Uh, so this is Mike's attempt of proving the need for sound barriers, which I think has already been proven, but unfortunately we need to go down this road again. And um, to add to add insult to injury, uh, the Mass DOT has recently announced a plan to renovate I-93, the, the viaduct there, or the over, or what would be the bridge of I-93 that cuts right through East Somerville. And in the past, we've been told by Mass DOT that the only way we can get sound barriers is if there's new construction. And now we have new construction and no commitment to sound barriers. So I think this is a step in the right direction, but it requires a lot more effort and a lot more fighting from the residents of Somerville. And I would like to plug on May 26 at 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to be holding a demonstration at the corner of McGrath Highway and Broadway uh, to demand both sound barriers as well as traffic uh, calming measures and pedestrian safety measures along McGrath Highway. Um, as we learned today, Marshall Mack, uh, the 72 year old hit and run victim on McGrath Highway passed away today. Uh, he was a Vietnam veteran, survived six years in a uh, prison of war camp, only to get killed walking home from the supermarket to get back to his house in the Mystic Housing Development. Uh, so this is a big um, highway justice issue, as we're calling it. Uh, it's about pedestrian safety. It's about the quality of air in East Somerville and Ward 4. And uh, these are really important issues. So I really encourage residents to get involved and come out on May 26th. 6 p.m. at the corner of McGrath and Broadway. Uh, please bring a mask. So you've got a couple of speakers, including Congressman um, Presley, who's rallying behind you. What would, what is the ideal? What are we, what are we fighting for in this particular area? Well, there's a group called the Somerville Alliance for Safe Streets, uh, which has put out a list of demands uh, that can really be boiled down to two demands: is one pollution mitigation on I-93. Uh, which is the sound barriers. Sound barriers can help address pollution mitigation. We would also like to see uh, triple glazed windows and uh, air filtration systems for the mystic housing development where sound barriers wouldn't necessarily help them with air pollution. Uh, that's the first big demand. And then the second big demand is for Mass COT to do what it's already promised us to do, uh, which is public uh, pedestrian safety measures along McGrath Highway in Mystic Valley uh, Parkway, I-93. Uh, they have told us that they're going to do this. It was supposed to be done in 2022 and they pushed it back to 2023. And in my experience in politics, you'll see that when 2023 comes around, it'll be 2024 and then 2025. Uh, so the timeline keeps getting moving back and we've had out now, I believe five deaths along McGrath Highway and Mystic Valley Parkway and we just can't wait any longer. So our second big demand is to ask Mass DOT to do what it already said it will do on an expedited timeline. When we are voting for our next round of, I, I know everybody in here in Somerville is talking about the city election, but when we're talking about voting for folks at the state level in the following election, is this an issue that we should be, as, as people in Somerville should be advocating for? I definitely think so. And I, I feel like uh, it's been frustrating living on this side of town 
um, and seeing such tremendous advocacy for pedestrian safety in areas that are much safer than McGrath Highway. Uh, this with people calling it the Highway of Death now, and you know we we have a uh, this movement called Vision Zero, which is meant to stop any deaths, to have zero deaths from pedestrian from car accidents. And we've had five uh, on this road and not that much advocacy for it. Uh, so I'm very glad to see that SAS and other activists are getting involved in East Somerville and recognizing that this really is the pedestrian safety issue in the city. There's, no, there's nowhere else in the city where you have to cross a highway to leave. Uh, if you live in East Somerville and don't and have to leave East Somerville, you have to cross I-93 or McGrath Highway twice a day uh, just to come and go. And this is a problem that's existed for 70 years since uh, the state and federal government cut our community in half with these highways. And I'm glad that it's finally happening. I think the, it requires advocacy. And I believe our elected officials uh, on the state level and local level are really pushing hard on this, but we need we need the public to advocate for it as well because uh, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, so to say. Um, the people who speak up the loudest and make demands, uh, they get listened to. So our government can be responsive, but we need the community uh, to really demand these changes. All right. Well, that's an, that's definitely this is a long time coming for sure. Yep, it's a few decades overdue. And for the context of all this um, is, you know, 70 years ago, they decided to cut I-93 through East Somerville. Uh, they seized a bunch of homes by eminent domain. If you go on what we call the state streets, which are all the streets adjacent to I-93 that are named after states, uh, you go to the second row of uh, streets and they're all half as long as all the other streets. And that's because those streets used to go all the way into Assembly Row. Um, and they seized all those properties by eminent domain, cut a highway through us. Uh, residents uh, who are still alive will tell you about how they laid down in front of bulldozers to try to stop this from happening. And they weren't successful, unfortunately. And they didn't even get sound barriers in the process. So this is very long overdue. And I'm glad that it's finally getting the attention that it needs. Fantastic. Well, we have limited time. Let's move on to another really big issue in the city. Um, we are talking about uh, the, oh, let me skip up to where I was. We're talking about the public safety building and the public private partnership. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, the city is proposing to build a public safety building at the former Cobble Hill Plaza that we seized by eminent domain a few years ago after the developer just refused to build. Uh, they had permits to build a 10 story apartment complex there with storefront and they started the partners sued each other and nothing ever happened of it. And in the meantime, we have this real serious need for a new public safety building, which is a police station and a fire station and possibly other uh, public safety amenities. Uh, so we took this property to uh, build the public safety building there. Uh, but when we did this, the city council explicitly said that we would like a public private partnership. We would like something more than just a public safety building there because this building is going to be right next to the Kensington, uh, not the Kensington, the, um, the East Somerville Green Line Station. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be right next to it. And this land is just very important for the future development of the city. And it can't be just a public safety building. And the whole council has spoken on this and I just get the feeling that we're going to get a public safety building and then they're going to tell us uh, we'll do all the nice things afterwards. Uh, but some someday never comes often. Uh, once I feel like once the public safety building is done, we won't return and redevelop the rest of the land uh, for a while. And we have an opportunity now. There used to be a 10 story building that was proposed there. We can build a 10 story building here and have public safety as aspects and maybe have residential component, maybe have commercial components, uh, something to both utilize the land as much as possible and also to cut down on the expenses. This is gonna be a project that we're gonna bond tens of millions of dollars for and our debt service uh, keeps going up. So we, we need to think for the future of this site and also for the future of our debt service to make sure that we don't, get, we don't burden future generations with debt. So this is a combined um, 
Top Shop and Fire Station. Yes. Um, so having uh, having been in some residences that are right next to fire stations, that gets pretty loud when when they're they're rolling out. Do you do you foresee residences above or uh, commercial property, business offices? What what would you put there? I would take either of those. Um, I think resident the, there was a previous residential proposal. Uh, that was approved by the community and got all their permits through the planning and zoning process. And they just never did anything with it. Um, and it, you can see there are examples of public private partnerships where there are for the, for example, a fire station with housing built on top of it. And they can uh, make triple glazed windows. They can do all sorts of things to make sure the noise doesn't affect the people in the building. Uh, and this is basically what we're asking for, whether it's commercial or residential or both. Uh, you have the ability to build up on this site. You can build tall and we should use every foot we have uh, to the benefit of the community. So I do, and I, I, as someone who has lived next to um, fire stations numerous times in my life, it is sometimes uh, an annoying sound, but it is an important sound to hear, especially when there's a fire. So and I think the certainly public... make you the, the safest residence in Somerville. <laughs> yeah, well, this side of town also does not have, yes, it's very difficult for a fire engine to get to this side of town, uh, just like Assembly Row, where we're also proposing very similar project, a uh, commercial development with a fire station built into it. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Uh, another example is if you go on the Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston, there's a fire station there and they have a 30 story commercial building on top of it. Mm -hmm. And that commercial building helped pay for the fire station. So mm -hmm. I don't think we need to go up 30 stories, but we have the ability to go tall and help that offset the cost of the public safety building. What do you do with the current police station? That's already being sold to uh, US2 and being made into a hotel. So this is what's frustrating to me is I, I fear that um, the city is going to uh, use the typical tactic of uh, creating an emergency where basically we have to approve a public safety building, otherwise we lose the safety of the community. And you have to do this now, otherwise it's your fault. But we've mm -hmm. only now come up with a location for the public safety building that came after we committed to sell the current public safety building to make a hotel. So I don't want to hear excuses when the time comes that we don't have time when they've put off for years uh, finding a location for this public safety building. So yeah, that, that the current safety building is in the heart of Union Square. It's a part of the Union Square redevelopment plan. It is going to be sold uh, for, for commercial use. And we can't just say, yeah, oh, we, we really have to do this now. That's not going to hold any weight with me at all because we've had time and the council has made their opinion very clear about what we'd like to see on this site. Hmm. Wow. All right. That's a another new debate coming up. Um, there's a question in, uh, in the agenda for tomorrow's meeting. Uh, making the mayor, whoever, whoever he, she, or they are, to produce an annual report on the status of housing in the city of Somerville. Um, according to this order, the report would document the quantity of what we have, breaking it down into sections like newly constructed condos, number of affordable units. Great to get this information. How do we then use it? Well, I think it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I could think of one example of how to use this, and I believe this was Councilor White who proposed this. Uh, but there is a question that often comes up about how much affordable housing do we actually have? Mm. How many units have been produced in a period of time? Are we actually meeting our summer vision goals? And I'll just say one example of how this could be used is one of my frustrations with the current zoning is only how you can really only build housing on the eastern side of town right now. Uh, we have a 20% inclusionary housing rate. So any development that happens has to have 20% affordable housing in it, uh, but you need to allow some height uh, to allow that development to happen. So if you have a three-story building and 20% affordable housing, that development's not getting built. But if you make it five stories, there's a possibility of, of it getting built. And I think what we'd see with this study most likely is finding that 
the amount of housing being built is extremely limited by these height restrictions. Mm -hmm. So I think if we had this data, we could prove that the affordable housing, which is a goal we all have, uh, that goal is not being met and it's possibly because of the restrictive zoning we have. Do you currently get, as counselors, do you currently get reports on housing? What, what, what makes this particular report different? You'd have to ask Bill, but I think uh, we have had, you know, during summer vision, things like this, they've updated us and they've given us status on housing in the city. But I think what Bill's going for is having a more consistent report so that we can make a year by year decision instead of every few years uh, when the city decides to put this information out. Okay. All right. Uh, one I found near and dear to my heart that the director of inspectional services established a dry ice rat extermination program. I remember living on Florence Street. I, literally, there was a, a, a business right there that had a rat mound at the corner of the street. Um, the, that the, 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 the the car wash? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Way back when. Um, all right. So can you explain what this is and, and, and why we want a dry ice rat extermination program? Yeah, so uh, the rodent problem continues to be a problem. It was a problem when I first got in office in 2014 and it's persisted, it's come in waves. Uh, I feel like there was a decrease in rodent activity recently and now the past few weeks, I'm getting nonstop calls about rodent issues. Uh, so dry ice is a method of killing rodents in their burrows that uh, previously was not approved by the FDA or the EPA. Uh, for use. So we couldn't use dry ice because the EPA did not say that it was an environmentally sound policy. Uh, they've since changed that policy. And I definitely think it's worth exploring uh, not to get too gruesome about the rat issue. Uh, but what the what it does dry ice produces carbon monoxide, which kind of quietly kills rodents in their holes. And it's kind of a proven method of killing rodents, one that we haven't used. So I think it's important to explore every possibility. We've had the dry ice program. We had a rodent birth control program. Uh, we have the city hired what I title the rat czar, which is a person who's dedicated solely to rodent issues. Uh, we've flyed neighborhoods to inform people about how to address rodent issues because rodents are a man-made issue. Uh, they can't survive without human beings providing them food and water. So we really need neighbors to make sure that they're not leaving food or water or other things out for rodents. Uh, so we, this is one of a thousand solutions uh, to address the problem. Uh, I am kind of jealous that there's somebody out there with the title rats are, that's pretty cool. The, um, but when you're talking about this- particular That's my title, I don't think, that's not the official title. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I believe it's the public, the community health liaison or something like that. Yeah, rat are is cooler. Yeah, exactly, so gets the point. The, the, this is, it, this is it just something interesting that happens sometimes with the council where this is a direction that the director of inspectional services do something. Is it odd or unusual to instruct a city employee how to do his or her job? Well, that's just the way the the orders are stated. Um, so I, we don't have the authority to tell the director of ISD what to do, but we do get listened to from time to time. So what we do is we'll have this item, we'll bring it to committee for discussion, uh, ask them how this could be implemented. If they don't say no or can't, we ask why not. And kind of some of the some of sometimes the pressure or the firm advice about how to do something. It gets listened to from time to time, such as I requested that the mayor create a rat czar position. He didn't have to do that, but they did it because it was in the best interest of the community. So I do think sometimes the orders are stated as instruct the director to do such and such, but it is ultimately up to the mayor and the city departments to follow those orders. All right. So uh, under communication from the city, we have, um, Chief Labor Council is submitting a home rule petition to define a domestic partner as a spouse and dependent in Somerville. Now, I know you and I haven't talked for a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of uh, movement going on in committees and whatnot. What, 
who does this ultimately affect? Is this uh, is this just city employees? No, so that's what. Well, this this one in particular would affect city employees. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a few months back, or maybe even a year ago now, uh, I submitted an order requesting that the city uh, recognize domestic partnerships. So if, if there's an example. I asked them or told them to do this. They didn't have to, but they did anyways uh, to recognize domestic partnerships because cities like Boston and Cambridge do this, but the city of Somerville didn't. Uh, and when I first did this, it was under the idea that residents in the community uh, could be denied healthcare access because their domestic partnership is not recognized. So I put in that order to address that issue and now this order is put in to basically address the city's issue where you can have a domestic partner, but not necessarily be covered under the Somerville healthcare system, the GIC healthcare system. Does this give domestic partners any, will this eventually give domestic uh, partners any other rights or responsibilities? I'd have to look at this uh, specific legislation, but I think this one is about healthcare for Somerville residents. So a lot of these issues do have to be addressed on the state and federal level. And I, our point was to allow whatever possible, uh, whatever, how would I say it? Wh whatever is possible under the law for a domestic partnership to be recognized, people should have those rights. So something like visiting people in a hospital or something is not something that the city of Somerville can necessarily do. But this is a step in that direction of just making sure domestic partnerships are recognized to begin with. It is um, getting warmer. We're all talking about, you know, it, being able to go out more and be be without a mask in the city of Somerville. Do you? Uh, what's the big thing to do in Somerville now that you see is safe? Oh, great. Um, I don't know. I've done so much walking during this entire pandemic. Uh, I just get out, walk out my front door and walk around the neighborhood. And it does feel good to not wear a mask now. Uh, so the city has lifted its mask mandate. I see a lot of people still wearing masks uh, out of an abundance of safety. But uh, you'll see the CDC and other scientists have said that it's uh, very difficult to catch coronavirus when you're outside. So I would encourage people to just go for a walk. Uh, we've opened up the farmer's market in Union Square now. So people will be able to do that. Hopefully we'll have some outdoor venues. And I think people should start to feel safe being outdoors. I, I would encourage people to continue to wear a mask indoors, but any sort of outdoor activity is uh, recommended. And it's been a great relief for me because most of, my, most of the things I like doing are outdoor activities, so. Uh, I encourage people to do the same. Well, that brings us back to the, you know, the rally that we had talked about earlier, where um, it's not hugely usual that a, um, if that's a odd construction there, Kat, it's, it's very unusual that uh, the council is actually encouraging people to come out for a rally um, to, to wear a mask. Could you talk a little bit more about it specifically uh, you're, there's a, uh, a mention of uh, Rep Connolly's blog post about some of the work along 93. What is the viaduct work that they're actually saying they're going to start? Well, I do want to first say that people should wear a mask if they come into the rally because we'll be in, an, we'll be in a uh, close proximity to other people. So mm -hmm. that's really important to still wear a mask when you're in close proximity. Uh, to other people outside. And we have had several rallies uh, around the Black Lives Matter movement and other issues during the pandemic. And people wore a mask and we were, we were all safe. There were no transmissions coming from these rallies. Uh, but the viaduct issue is basically, as I understand it, the viaduct is basically the land bridge uh, of I-93 that cuts through East Somerville. And it's corroded and needs serious repairs. So it's an issue that needs to happen. Uh, this and the state recognizes the importance of this and have prioritized this, but they haven't prioritized sound barriers and pedestrian safety, which is what's frustrating to us. So this viaduct issue is also going to be a lot of nighttime construction. So people are going to have to listen to loud noises at night when they live right next to I-93. And to me, this just exemplifies uh, uh, shows the importance of sound barriers around there. 
uh, not just for the road, for the cars, but for the hire, for the construction that's about to come too. So it, it's basically making sure the bridge doesn't collapse. And in exchange for that, we would like the sound barriers that we were told could only happen if construction like this was to occur. All right, so if you can't come out to the rally for whatever reason, or it's just, it's not comfortable for you to be around that many people, how do, how do you suggest that folks advocate for Somerville? I would say to uh, contact your state representatives, to contact MassDOT. I think after this rally, we will have more uh, advice as to how to advocate. And th this is not a one-time thing. I've already told people that this is a decades long problem and it's gonna take a years long effort to address this issue. Uh, if people were interested in, uh, in helping us with this, they could contact me uh, at mattforward1 at gmail.com. That's matt for ward one at gmail.com and i can plug you into the some of uh, the this the sas group and yeah there's a lot of work that needs to be done so it's not going to be just one rally fantastic all right so um i as you know i'm recently back in somerville always trying to figure out the best place to eat we have if you about 30 seconds left uh, eating inside or outside, what's the pl best place to go in Somerville right now? I Well, I think I mentioned last time, Rincon is my favorite spot in East Somerville. Uh, it's a Mexican restaurant that has indoor and outdoor seating. Uh, the outdoor seating is particularly nice. I, I guess I should plug another place since I plugged them already. Uh, Gaucho's is a great Brazilian restaurant on Broadway that has a lot of outdoor seating. Uh, and we've allowed them to build their seating out onto Broadway itself so that they can have so that they can get through the pandemic they had a uh, they recently renovated the whole place to have a nice bar and indoor seating and televisions and then the pandemic hit uh, so i definitely would like to encourage people to go to gauchos because they invested a lot of money into their property and we need to make sure they stick around fantastic well thank you for the advice i'll get a reservation at gauchos from the summerville media center thanks so much we'll see you soon all right, thank you.